so appreciative of the fact that the Holy Ghost is working with and through our pastor to move us more and more into the community. And we need that. Our community needs that. I was thinking about Jesus. What a soul winner he was. And isn't it interesting? Jesus did not come targeting rich people. He did not come targeting professional people. He did not come targeting highly educated people. Jesus came targeting the common man. In fact, in many cases, the poor. And it's interesting, as he reached for the poor, there were people of wealth that attached themselves to him. There were some outstanding people in the community that became believers. But that's not who Jesus was targeting. He just reached, well, actually for anybody, anybody. I still believe it works that way. Somebody said years ago, I don't know who said it first. I've heard several people say it. I don't know who said it first, but I, I like this. Said if you'll reach for the people that nobody wants, God will give you the people that everybody wants. Hello. I believe that's gonna happen here at Southland Tabernacle. If we'll just reach for common folks, even for the poor, if we have place for the poor, I believe that God will not only give us those, but I believe there's other folks that will come into the kingdom. Praise God. And I certainly look forward to that. God bless you, you may be seated. And I have felt very strongly impressed of the Lord, actually stretching back over a week or two. Wasn't sure when I would be teaching this until just a few days ago, but I felt very strongly to bring a Bible lesson to us tonight titled Navigating Through the Darkness. The Darkness. And I would say most everybody here has some experiences in the dark, in the darkness, darkness of your soul, darkness of your mind, dark, darkness of your emotions. And if you've never had any experience with darkness, would you please write a book? <laughs> All right. There's two primary definitions of darkness. One is the partial or total absence of light. And the second one is wickedness or evil. Wickedness or evil. Darkness is often used figuratively or symbolically to represent sadness. Have you ever had any interaction with sadness? Misery. Ever been miserable? Depression. There's a lot of that in our world right now. Fear. Grief. Mystery. Or the unknown. Confusion. Uncertainty. Or a lack of understanding. Darkness is used figuratively regarding each of these subjects. Darkness is often symbolic of that which is uncomfortable, unfamiliar, painful, inconvenient, and sometimes downright scary. Now here's a couple of anchor truths and I put them right in here at the beginning of the lesson. The Lord God is not afraid of the dark, and he never has been. Could I just tell you the darkness that's in our world right now, and there's gross darkness over the people, but it does not intimidate God. God is never intimidated by natural darkness. Now, growing up, I was intimidated by natural darkness. I remember when my father was pastoring the church in Warsaw, Indiana, before they built the new building, we had an old house that had been converted into a church. 
And our family lived on the second floor. Church was on the first floor and our family lived on the second floor. And it wasn't the best arrangement because there was only one restroom in the building. So that meant that anybody in the church who needed to use the restroom had to go into where we lived to use the restroom. And uh, so that was not the best arrangement. And uh, over time they were able to fix that. <laughs> My mother made sure that they got that fixed pretty quick. <laughs> But I remember one day we were sitting out where pastor always parked his car. We came in, it was dark, there was no church that night. And my dad said, son, I'll give you a nickel if you'll just get out and walk all the way around the church building and come back to the car. Now, back in those days, a nickel was a nickel. A nickel's not a nickel anymore. I started thinking about all the things I could buy with a nickel. You could, you used to could buy those dream sickles, those push, anybody ever eat one of those, those push up dream sickles? You could buy those for a nickel. You could buy a drumstick at one time for a nickel. And I was thinking about it, thinking about it, but no matter how much I wanted those things, I wasn't willing to walk around that church building in the dark to get my nickel. Hello? But God's not intimidated by natural darkness. He's not intimidated by spiritual darkness. He's not intimidated by mental darkness. And he's not intimidated by societal darkness. He's not intimidated by emotional darkness, nor any other kind of darkness. I love John chapter one where it says, in the beginning was the word. This is not in your notes. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him there was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The original translation from the Greek actually would be like this. The light shined in the darkness, and it was not possible for the darkness to wrestle the light to the ground. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. God is not intimidated by all the stuff going on in our world. He's not having a panic attack. All right, now, I want to go back here and just take a moment and tell you this universe that we're in tonight what a magnificent creation. It all started in the dark. Did you ever think about that? It all started in the dark. Genesis 1 and 2. Second verse of the Bible. The earth was formless, shapeless, and void, empty. And everybody say it. Darkness. Darkness was over the face or the surface of the deep. All right? And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Now I want you to notice some very interesting facts that are revealed to us in this one Bible verse. First of all, the earth did not yet exist at this time. It was formless and void. Okay? It was just, a, earth was just a concept in the mind of God. Earth did not come into being until Genesis chapter one, verses nine and 10. So this is seven verses before the earth came into being. Earth was a concept in the mind of God. The darkness that this verse references was total darkness. It was as black as it could get. It was as deep as it could get. It, get. it, was, uh, it was dark, 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 dark because light had not yet been created. There was no such thing as light. It was pitch black. It was a thousand midnights wrapped into one. But notice this, God was present. God was present in this deep, deep darkness. 
Could I just say it now? I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I just feel like saying it now. You'll never go through a darkness so deep that God won't be there. I feel the Holy Ghost. When there had not even been any light created yet, there was no such thing as a flashlight. There was no such thing as a candle. There was no sun. There were no stars. It was black, black, black. But God was there. And even though it was very dark, the Spirit of God was moving. Woo! I like that. Pitch black. But the Spirit, the Spirit of God was active. The Spirit of God was moving. Hallelujah. Now our adversary, Satan, would have us believe that the darkness that passes over and through our lives indicates the absence of God. Whenever you go through a dark time, one of the accusations that the devil will bring to your mind is that God is absent. God doesn't care. Why would he leave me in this position? Hello? All that the devil's doing, folks, it's an old trick. It's the trick that says if it's dark, if you're going through darkness, God's absent. This is obviously not true. As revealed, get this, in the very first chapter of the Bible. From the very beginning, God has wanted us to understand that he is always present, even in the darkest moments of our life. Woo! It, somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. I feel a hallelujah in my spirit tonight. Now, think about this with me. Some of God's greatest work is performed in the dark. Moments ago, we read one verse, which is a summation. That verse is a summation of the magnificent miracle called creation. Creation, ladies and gentlemen, was birthed in darkness. New creation begins in the dark. Consider this, the conception and development of a baby in the womb. That entire process from conception until the time of birth occurs in the dark. You were formed in the dark. I was formed in the dark. The first months of my life, it was totally dark. Hello? So some of God's greatest work is done in abject darkness. New creation begins in the dark. Consider this, the purchase of our redemption transpired mostly in the dark. Consider this biblical testimony concerning the events surrounding Calvary. Matthew 27, 45. Now, from the sixth hour, which is noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, which is three o'clock in the afternoon. Notice this though, from noon to three o'clock, there was darkness over all the land. Many believe that it was a solar eclipse. Could have been. Hello? But while Jesus hung on that cross, purchasing your salvation and my salvation, he did it in darkness. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hmm. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He cried that after three hours of total darkness 
on the earth. Your redemption, my redemption. His blood was spilling on the ground while it was dark. Does anybody understand what I'm telling you? Don't let the devil tell you that God's not working for you just because it's dark in your life. I'm telling you, God never leaves you. He never gives up on you. Come on, somebody. Mm. I think we ought to just praise the Lord for a moment. Hallelujah. Your redemption was purchased in the dark. This very Sunday, we will celebrate Easter, which we prefer to call Resurrection Sunday. It is worthy of note that the resurrection happened in a sealed tomb. The resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ happened in total darkness. Woo! The power of our salvation was released in the dark. Folks, when his eyelids popped open and he sat up in that grave and then stood up in the dark, that very moment released Holy Ghost power, salvation to a world. And folks, it happened in the dark. I just feel like somebody ought to tell the devil tonight, you're a liar. You've been telling me that God's turned his back on me because it's dark. But I'm telling you, some of God's greatest work happens in the dark. The same is also true of the New Testament believer in Jesus. Our new creation as a redeemed and born again disciple of Jesus began in the dark. First Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. His own special, you are his own special people. Do you understand that tonight? You, my brother, you, my sister, you are his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him. Here it is, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. When Jesus called for me, I was in the dark. When Jesus called for you, you were living in darkness. Now, Satan always seeks to exploit darkness for our destruction. That's why in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, he said, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand against the wiles, the strategies, the deceits of the wicked, of the devil. For we, here it is, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Against powers, look at this, folks, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. You're battling darkness. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. The devil always, you know, I've talked to some people that got a rude awakening after they got saved. When they first started coming to church, they looked around, they saw the godly people and, and they said these folks are all angels I want to go to that church that's angelic over there and they, got, they repented they got baptized they got the Holy Ghost and they thought all their troubles were over had no idea that on the other side of that baptistry on the other side of this altar you're still going to have to battle darkness It's not a cruise into heaven. <laughs> and so the devil tries to manipulate our darkness to get us to think that God's actually against us. That's what the devil's after. He wants you to think that either God doesn't care or that God doesn't like you. And he is out to get you. Hello. 
So he's always trying to manipulate darkness. Now, top of page three, let's consider some of the ways, this is only a few, of the ways in which, number one, in which demons seek to manipulate us into our own destruction. When the devil's messing with you in the dark, it's not because he's trying to improve your life. Somebody needs to hear that. When the devil's messing with you in the dark, it's not because he's trying to improve your life. He's trying to seal your doom to the lake of fire. So we need to consider some of the things that he does to try to manipulate us. And then we need to consider how can we neutralize and counteract those attempts. And I'm asking the licensed ministers, they're going to help me with this a little bit tonight. It's going to be a little bit interactive. Asking them to give some responses here, some practical applications on how we can counteract these manipulations of the devil. First of all, one of the things the devil does to try to bring darkness into our lives is by, rem is by reminding us of our past egregious sins and wrongful actions and by suggesting to us that we are still guilty. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But is there anybody here tonight, you, you can raise your hand in your heart, okay? Just, just raise your heart, okay? Is there anybody here that the devil ever reminded you of something you did in the past that you're very ashamed of? You've repented of it a hundred times. And he still tries to bring it up and make you feel guilty. Hello. So he does this. He comes against us to make us think that we haven't really been forgiven. That God is still holding it against us. There's been a lot of people that tripped up over that one. Some of them fortunately found their way back, but there's others that are not back yet. Because the devil convinced them that no matter what they did to try to be right with God, they could never really be right because of what they did in the past. So how are there, what are some of the practical things that we can do to fight this effort of the devil to manipulate us with darkness? Let's start with Brother Noe right here. Would you stand please? Yes. Uh, one of the things that I do is I just remind myself that when the enemy suggests to me that I'm not forgiven, it's really not an attack on me. It's an attack on the Word of God. The Word of God says that there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. So for, for him to have that act, for that to take purchase in my mind, I would have to believe that the, the Bible is invalidated. And so I remind myself the promises of God and what the Bible tells me and that that's just a lie. That's good. Brother Kittle, would you respond to that as well? I always think that when I was baptized in the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus washed away all of my sins. So that means that God doesn't remember of him. Satan might remember it, but he can bring it to my attention, bring it to my mind. But you know what? God doesn't remember. He may remember, but all that matters is that it's gone. It's under the blood. And I get peace every time I think about that. All right. That's good. You can remember some things that God chooses not to remember. He's got the ability. He's God. If he says that's forgiven and I don't want to remember that anymore, I will not remember that anymore. He's got the ability to do that. So you can remember some things and I can remember some things that God chooses not to remember. And I like something that the brother from Alaska said while he was here, dead men don't tell tales. When you have repented of it, when you have killed it, when you have put it out of your life, you've asked the Lord for his forgiveness and you're endeavoring to walk in victory, that voice talking to you is a dead man trying to live again. Hello? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are not hidden. He didn't say old things are hidden. He said old things are passed away and all things are become new. Let's look at another one here. 
Sometimes the devil uses other people to remind us of or shame us regarding the past. Now, this doesn't happen as often, but it does happen. There's sometimes people in the church, happens even in the church, of course it happens out of the church, that's for sure, but sometimes in the church, there are people that know a mistake a person made years ago. And whenever that person tries to get above that mistake, they've repented, they, they've brought their repentance to God, they've asked for forgiveness, the blood has covered them. Sometimes there are people that don't wanna let go of that. They don't want that person to be able to get back to where they were. That's a wrong spirit, folks. Instead of kicking people that are down, we need to be supportive of people that are down. We need to help them get back up on their feet. Come on, somebody. And none of us have a right to sit in that kind of judgment on anybody because if it wasn't for the mercy and grace of God, we wouldn't be where we are today. So what's a, what's a good way to deal with this? Brother Vincent Bird, would you respond to that, please? Jesus said in John 6 and 44, he said that no man can come to me unless the Father draws him. Mm -hmm. So if we feel shame regarding our past or, and that affects the presence of God in our life, we need to stand on the word of Jesus that he said we, that wouldn't even take us toward him unless it was the Father drawing us. And, and just like there can be attacks through other people, we can leverage that to go toward God and, and get a closer relationship with him. Very good. Very good. All right. So here's a third thing. Here's another way the devil tries to manipulate darkness. When we attempt to pray or worship, and yet we do not really feel God's presence. Again, I won't ask you to raise your hands. I'll just ask you to raise your heart. You ever been to a place where for a few services, you didn't really feel what you knew you should be feeling? Hello? Now some of you looking at me like, what are you talking about, Bishop? No, I'm talking to you. Even as Bishop, I have services sometimes or prayer times that I don't feel God like I ought to feel him, like I want to feel him. Hello? So the devil, will come to you. Now sometimes I've been in church and I didn't feel God very much because I was just slap tired. Hello? <laughs> I mean, it's, if I'm really, really tired, you're gonna have to have a great service <laughs> to get me moving. Hello? I'm just being honest. Hello? When our bodies are tired, many times we're not as open to the working of the Spirit of God. Other times it could be just that there's distractions in our life. And we come to the house of God and we go through the motions, but we're not really connecting with God like we should. Or we get down to pray and we do pray and we still read our Bible, but the connection is not as strong as it should be. Hello. And the devil will try to use that. Say, ah, you're backslid. You must be backslid. You went through that service, other people were rejoicing, shouting, and you didn't feel any of that in here. You just kind of endured the service. Got a bunch of people looking at me like, that's not me, I never do anything like that. But we've all done it, folks. I've had some services, I'm just gonna be honest, Pastor. I've had some services I endured. I mean, I, I tried to make the best of it I could. I didn't just sit there and do nothing. I did try to worship. I did try to pray. Hello? Is this too real for you folks? <laughs> so how do we counteract that when the devil comes and says, ha ha ha, you went to that service and you didn't really feel very much of God. Other people were really getting something out of it. You didn't get anything out of it. Or you go down to pray and you, you go through and you pray, but the connection doesn't happen. So how do we respond to that? Brother Andrew Brown, would you talk to us a moment? 
Well, I think in those times, we need to do a little self-reflection, see if there's any truth, if there's really something in our lives that's out of line with God or out of line with the man of God. And I think also we should look at the Word of God as well in those times. Um, you know, we don't always have to feel God's presence, but we can look in His Word and see His promises in His Word and know that His Word is truth and His Word will endure forever. And we can find strength in the Word of God when we Absolutely. don't feel His presence. Absolutely. That's good. Brother Cavazos, let's talk about that. I believe there's uh, many times that even at home, you can worship and praise God. And it doesn't mean just because you don't feel his presence, his presence is not there. It is there. We, a bishop had read in Genesis, it, all the dark and the deep, but his presence was there even in the dark. Right. You may be in a dark area, yeah. but his presence is still there at church. Yes. Keep praising, keep worshiping, and God's presence will be known a little baby that day, maybe the next day, but if you keep worshiping, you'll feel his presence. Absolutely. Praise God. What do you do when you pray and you don't feel God? What do you do? Years ago, I heard Bishop Robert McFarland, who used to be General Secretary of the United Pentecostal Church, he said, occasionally there will be a service where it just doesn't really get off the ground. He was talking to pastors. He said, pastors, if that happens, don't attack the church. Just say, hey folks, we love you. We didn't get where we wanted to get tonight. We'll see you next service. In other words, of course, I'm not saying that we just give up, but what he was saying was, there's sometimes you just have to let bygones be bygones and come back for a fresh start. Fresh start. Okay? What do you do when you pray and you can't feel God? I've had people, I've had people talk to me and say, Pastor Bishop, I've been praying, I've been coming to church and I just haven't been feeling the Lord. What do you do? I've said to them, how bad do you want to go to heaven? Do you want to go to heaven bad enough to battle through that? Do you want to go to heaven bad enough that you uh, will keep on plugging away until you, there is a breakthrough? And I think you touched on this, Brother Cavazos. It's really true. If you'll just keep doing what you know to do, the breakthrough will come. I said the breakthrough will come. All right. Here's another one. This is a big one. Devil really works on this one. When we petition God earnestly in prayer with a request, oh God, I need you to do this. I need you to help me with this. But seemingly we receive no response or no answer. The devil will come and say, ah, I thought you were a believer. I thought your Bible said that the Lord, if you would ask, you would be given. If you'd seek, you would find. If you would knock, the door would be open. And you've been asking, you've been seeking, you've been knocking, and the door's still closed. So he tries to manipulate your darkness. So how do we counteract that? Let's see. I don't think we've heard from Brother Louis yet. Brother Gonzalez. I actually shared this with Pastor on the way in. I can testify God is so good if we continue to pray and we continue to knock and seek and he will do it. For three years, I prayed a prayer and got no answer. But the Lord, he continued as, and we just kept on praying, kept on praying. And the Lord always gives us a word. And I think that's important is we always look for the word to give us that strength. And one of the words was, I know the thoughts I have towards you. Right. I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace. 
and not of evil right. to give you an expected end. Right. So when we keep on praying, we may not we may not see the answer, but he's doing the work in the background. He's doing the work in the darkness. Yes. And one day it will come to light. That's very good. Now, this is a place where I want you to raise your hand. OK, not just your heart. Raise your hand if this applies. How many of you have a prayer request that you've asked God more than once and it still is not answered? Could I see your hand? You see why we have this Bible study tonight? Because we all deal with this. All right. I've asked pastor just to comment on any one of these that he wants. Just step up there. Whatever. Thank you, Bishop. I have so many thoughts going through my mind, but I won't lengthen the Bible study. But when the enemy reminds you of your past, and this happened just today, I, it wasn't about my past, but I was actually discouraged. There were some things that happened today, and it, it was in relation to outreach, and some individuals weren't here, so I was somewhat discouraged. And the enemy tried to discourage me, and when that happens, I just begin to remind him of his future. I begin to remind him that Jesus is a victorious, that he lost the battle on Calvary that we will triumph. So when the enemy reminds you of your past, remind him of his future and say, my future is in Christ. If in the, I'm in Christ, I will be victorious. When you're worshiping God, you don't necessarily feel like it. I think you just remind yourself, we don't serve God out of emotion, but we serve God because we love him. And if we do that, we'll eventually see and feel his presence. And when you pray and there's no answer that comes, I'm reminded of Job. And I think we just have to tell God, Lord, I trust you. I trust you with your silence. I trust you when you say no. I trust you when you say move forward. I trust you even when I can't feel you. Like Job said, though he slay me, yet... I will trust him. Yeah. I'm thankful for the hand of God. Even in darkness, we can trust him. If you're thankful for the light of God, give him some praise. Praise God. Let's go ahead and praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Please get this, folks. If you are sincere to the best of your ability about living for God, there's never a time, I don't care how black it is, how dark it is, there's never a time that God is not working with you and for you. I love the revelatory lyrics to the gospel song Waymaker. You are Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Listen to this light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. And I love this part. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Somebody give him a shout of praise. You may have come into this service tonight at the most discouraging time in your life, but God wants you to know he is at work. He is working even when you don't see it, even when you don't feel it. He is at work for you and with you. Here's an anchor truth. Even in the darkest times in our lives and ministries, God is ever and always working for our good. Now let's look briefly at reasons why God allows darkness to come into our lives. We don't always get this. We don't always receive an explanation from God as to why he allows things to happen. I've asked God a few times, Lord, why did this happen? Sometimes God lets you know why it happened. Sometimes you find out later on down the road why it happened. And sometimes you just keep walking and you never find out why it happened, at least not on this side. 
Maybe on the other side you'll find. Because you know, there's so many things we say, well, you know, we'll understand it better by and by. We'll understand it better. You know, I'm going to understand this, that. You know, I really wonder if that's the case. Because when you get on the other side, folks, that stuff isn't even going to matter. <laughs> It's not going to matter. Just the fact that you're standing on streets of gold and you know you have eternal life. Wow. Woo. I'm having a hard time keeping from preaching here tonight. I'm sorry. <laughs> Woo. We don't always receive an explanation from God. If I could have held on to Queen Mother, I would have. But the Lord told me before it was ever, before we ever understood what was going on, before it was ever documented what her problem was, the Lord told me that it was her time to exit. So I was on the spot because she was so determined she was going to live. She was adamant and she prayed that way. And she would tell people, I'm going to be healed. I'm going to be healed. And she has been healed. Not the way she thought, but she has been healed. I prayed for her healing too. But I never told her that she was going to be healed. Because I knew the Lord had let me know that it was her time. Now, I don't know why. I could have sure used her around a few places this last year. <laughs> but... We don't always get an answer from God as to why. Notwithstanding, we can be absolutely sure that whenever God permits something, it's always connected to his purpose for us and through us. Writer Terry A. Wilson, this came out of the Savannah Morning News, has shared a few of the possible reason that God allows darkness to temporarily surround us. One, to purge the sin and dross out of our lives. Sometimes the only way God can get some things out of our stubborn soul is to let a little darkness come to our life. Hello? And I want to say this. We typically grow more through the dark times than we do when everything's rosy. I've had some deep, dark experiences in my life, and I can say this tonight, and I give God the praise. I came out of them a better man than I was when I went into them. Another reason God allows darkness is to gain our attention so that we may receive his instructions and direction. It's especially true, I think, in this day and time because so many of us have life so good. And it's so easy when people are blessed to not feel their need of God. Even saints, even saints, to not feel their need of God because they got everything they need. So sometimes he has to allow some darkness to come to wake us up, that we always need his instructions and his direction. Another reason that he allows darkness is to increase our faith. To bring about his own sovereign purposes or purpose. Page four, to help, to help us help others when they pass through dark times. When a brother or sister goes through something and you've been through something very identical, maybe not exactly the same, but very close, you can offer encouragement to them and say, you know, I went through that and God helped me. And the same God that helped me, he's going to help you. Come on, somebody. Comfort people with the comfort that God has given you. He also does it to protect us from our own selfish ambitions. And he does it sometimes to draw us into greater intimacy with him. Now let's talk about experiencing dark encounters. There are a plethora of situations and circumstances that can bring darkness to our lives. Serious illness, death of a loved one, loss of employment, 
unexpected financial setbacks. I feel for the folks that have had their accounts drained by hackers who went online and managed to get into their account and take everything that they owned out of their account. I feel for those people. Unfair and brutal attacks, whether they be verbal, emotional, or physical. Here's another thing, weakness and temptation can cause us to experience darkness. Betrayal and so many more. Mental, emotional, or spiritual darkness means that we contend with, one, a lack of clarity in our understanding. It's dark, we don't understand. It means that we have questions to which we have no present answers. I get a lot of people that come to me, both in this church and in the outside ministry, say, Bishop, I have a question for you. <laughs> I've got a standard answer. If it's not too hard, I'll talk to you about it if it's not too hard. Because there's questions, folks, for which I don't have any answer, you don't have an answer. Hello? And here's another one that can create, and we t touched on this one already, unanswered prayers can cause darkness to come over us. It may seem that God is paying no attention to us at all. But once again, let's do what a couple of these brethren mentioned. Let's look to the word of God regarding dealing with darkness. 1 Kings 8 and 12. This is a great verse. Then spake Solomon. He's talking to Israel. The Lord said, the Lord said, he would dwell in thick darkness. It never gets too dark for God. I said it never gets too dark for God. God also promised us, Hebrews 13 and 5, part B, for God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. Matthew 28, 20, part B, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So it is imperative to learn that we learn how to navigate through the darkness. If we fail this challenge, we can become so confused and disoriented, number one, that we blame God. I've had people that I invited to church tell me, I won't go to church. Why? I'm mad at God. They've actually said that. I'm mad at God. Why? He took my mother. Or he took my brother. So it's when we get confused in the darkness, we can get so confused that we start blaming God for things that we don't understand. Secondly, we can develop a bitter attitude toward the Lord God or others. Get confused, disoriented in the dark. You ever had a bad attitude toward God? Don't raise your hand. Just raise your heart. <laughs> trying to keep the confession sanitary here tonight. I've had a bad attitude toward God before. I've gone to God and said, Lord, my attitude toward you right now is not right. I confess it to you. I'm sorry. I don't have a right to be upset with you. You're the potter, I'm the clay. Come on, somebody. Here's another thing that happens when people get confused or disoriented. We can cancel out our eternal salvation. There are people that are in the world tonight that used to sit on these pews and other church pews full of the Holy Ghost, worshiping God, but tonight they're lost because they got confused in the darkness. They got disoriented in the darkness. Folks, no matter how dark it is, you and I must just keep on walking with the Lord. Here's some other helpful observations from Terry A. Wilson, top of page five. He said, God loves each of us more than we can imagine. Secondly, those who trust and obey God fare far better than those who fight against him. And thirdly, the Bible offers a tremendous amount of comfort and guidance to those who are going through tough times. 
How many times when it was dark have you picked up your Bible and said, Lord, I need you to speak to me. I need a word from you. And it might be Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Oh, hallelujah. I want to hurry through this next part, but I don't want to leave it out. Some things can only be seen at night. Genesis 15, one through six. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, do not be afraid or fear not, Abram. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. Here's some insights from this verse. Number one, this was a night vision. This was not a vision in the daytime. It was a night vision. We learned that from verse number five. Secondly, this is the, get this folks, this is the first time in the Holy Scriptures that the Word of God declares the Word of the Lord came to a person. First time in the Bible. First time that the Bible says the Word of the Lord came to a person. Also, it's the first time in Scriptures that the Lord God told an individual to fear not or be not afraid. First time. Abram, Got a message for you. Fear not. Be not afraid. All right, but Abram said, Lord, what will you give me seeing I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, look, and the, uh, the concept here is look around. Look around me, Lord. You've given me no offspring. Look around my house. Look around my property. I have no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside. Here's how we know it was night. And said, look now toward heaven. Look up. Abram, you said to me, look around. I'm saying to you, Abram, look up. Sometimes we get into trouble because all we do is look around. But God is challenging this church to look up. Woo! You folks are making it hard on me tonight. I feel the preaching spirit here. He said, and count the stars if you're able to number them. Can we have that photo I gave you? Take the verse out of it, please. There you go. Look up toward heaven, Abram, and count the stars if you are able. Woo! And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Folks, we, we, we live in this world, so we do have to look around some. It's good to look around. But folks, don't ever look around so much that you get your eyes off of heaven. The Lord is saying to us, look up, look up, lift up your heads, look up. So in effect, Abram was told to look up. Generally speaking, the stars can only be seen at night. It took a nighttime, get this, it took a nighttime scene for the Lord to demonstrate to Abram the enormity of his promise to the patriarch. He would have never got that revelation had he not been led into the dark. Hello? There's some things you'll learn in the dark, folks. There's things I've learned in the dark that you'll never learn in the light. We all like light. Human beings were made for light but we're also in need of darkness. Did you know darkness is actually vital to our lives? I can't go there, I don't have time. But anyway, the star-studded night reminds us that God is what makes the world go around and not us. 
Verse six, and he believed the Lord. Musicians, praise team, would you come please? I'm gonna turn this back to pastor in just a moment. And he believed the Lord. He believed in the Lord. And he accounted it to him for righteousness. Get this insight, folks. Hope you're still there. Look at this. Abraham's faith was propelled by an experience that he had with Almighty God during the night. His faith was born out of darkness. Who? Somebody needs to know you're going through a tough time right now. It's been dark for a while. Sometimes it seems like it's pitch black. It seems like it's, it's, sometimes you wonder if there'll ever be light again. But somebody needs to know God is in your darkness. There are other biblical characters whose lives were transformed through a spiritual encounter with God. Praise team, come on up here. Come on up. You can go right here behind me and be fine. Somebody's giving me music that I wasn't ready for. Okay. There are other biblical characters whose lives were transformed through a spiritual encounter with God, get this, that happened during a nighttime in their lives. Can you think of other Bible characters that had a great encounter with God in a nighttime of their lives? Even in the dark, even in the night, God is at work. Now I wanna wrap it up with this. Everybody, would you stand please? Thank you, you've been a great audience here tonight. You've been so charged that I've had a hard time just teaching and not preaching. <laughs> Here's an anchor truth. Please, don't put your notes away yet. Hold on to them. Here's an anchor truth. All darkness, everybody say all darkness, all darkness. ends for the believer when eternity begins. What a fabulous promise. Recur concerning heaven is this one, Revelation 22 and 5. And there shall be no night there. Woo! <laughs> and they need no candle, nor light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. Would you move right into the altar here? We're gonna sing a couple of times, or at least one time, this song, and then pastor's gonna lead us in prayer. But I want us to worship here with this song. Come as close as you can, and let's, let's sing and worship together.